So obviously um, this is what we see on radar down in Edinburgh, it's the same on all positions, we can zoom in and zoom out but this would be our standard 40 mile range which is marked up here. So Fife which is you know, what we call the Scotty Dog's Head, for the GA guys flying out of Fife, Largo Bay is up here, Creel up here, uh, St Andrews up this area with Lucas, it's down the 4th, Edinburgh's right in the middle, the fine approaches for runway 24 and 06. Um, and uh, at the moment, so we've got inbounds here, all with a little PH, which is obviously EGPH for Edinburgh. So Jersey 3 Delta Hotel, we've got the Delta, the North Shuttle, the Finnair, a Ryanair and a Stobart, all coming inbound from here. So all of these grayed out lines are just the boundaries of controlled airspace. In here we can descend to 6,000 feet, 4,000 feet in here, 3,000 feet in the panhandle, and on final approach... Um, we are surface up to 6,000 feet Class D. This is all Class D airspace. A little bit of Class E at the top, um, but we speak into basically everything inbound to Edinburgh right now. So down on the strip board, um, this is basically a digital representation of what we used to use 10 years ago when we used to use paper. So what we have is we have orange strips for inbounds, we have blue strips for outbounds and we have pink strips, we don't have any right now, for aircraft that have taken off from somewhere else and are landing somewhere else. So all of your GA guys out of Fife or Dundee, returning to Dundee, we would have them on a pink strip. So what we've got down here is basically lowest is first, that generally uh, is the way that we work. So we've got Delta 208 who is cleared to descend to 3,000 feet. He's cleared for the ILS approach, runway 24, because it's green with a downward arrow. Uh, he's on a heading of 2.0 degrees to close and establish. This little thing here just means at some point we've coordinated descent with Glasgow, so he's obviously come from the west. We've got descent early in their airspace, rang them for that, cleared it with Glasgow and descended early. Uh, next one up will be Jersey 3 Delta Hotel, descent to 3,000 feet, 3.20 degrees. Um, so that's the same for all of those strips, all of those are inputted in the same way. And the Delta 208 we can see is a 757 medium vortex category, that's his squawk, 1420. Nothing done with the speed right now, but that's where the speed would go if we put one in. Q&H here, uh, his ATIS information and whether he's I4, VFR type of approach here. So he's doing an ILS approach to run with 24, and that's it. So what the controller is doing is on the screen, can you pan up to that or not? So on the screen we've got the Delta 208 which is just establishing on the ILS at about 6 miles and um, the radar controller will be passing that to tower very shortly, which he's just doing now. Jersey 3 Delta Hotel turning in behind, uh, the North Shuttle will be number 3, Stobart probably number 4, Finnair probably number 5 and the Ryanair. So the name of the game is to get them all on the ILS at about 10 miles at 3,000 feet, established on the ILS and once they're stable we'll chuck them to tower. So you can see this is a Saturday so this would be what we would normally call a relatively quiet day and it's still quite busy and the weather today is a bit poor so uh, if you've got good weather this would be a strong VFR day, a lot of VFR aircraft going through the zone wanting to see the bridges, the city centre and crossing. You've got to get a VFR in between all of those gaps. So um, we could talk about how we do that upstairs because ultimately it's easier for the tower controller to do it than the radar controller to do it. Um, but you can see there's an integration problem between the two and it's a little bit tricky. Right, so just an example aircraft. So if you've got, um, if you fly in a PA-28, you've rendered it out of Fife, got Bravo India, okay, India Tango, it's a PA-28. If you just call up Edinburgh Radar and just say Edinburgh Radar, got Bravo India, India Tango, the first thing the controller is going to do is look to see if you've already rung ahead. 
So the first thing he's going to do is we've got a little activate box here. So we're going to press the activate box and you can see here we've got a Golf Charlie Foxtrot Oscar Juliet. So that guy's rang ahead and booked out. Um, Golf India Tango, which we're looking for, is not there. So what you'll get is you'll call air traffic and they'll say standby. They'll check that. He's not there. At the moment, I wouldn't know if you're an inbound or an overflight. So if you were an inbound, I would check this box as well. And I've got to go through all of those strips to see if that call sign's there. It's not there. Now I need to, I know I've got to do a new strip. So I've got to hit new and then I've got to call you back. So I've got to go, go Bravo India Indy Tango, pass your message. You pass your details, so go Bravo India Indy Tango. I'm a P it, you know, so I've got to type that in. Golf, Bravo, India, India, Tango, Ender. I'm a P it 28. Vortex category light, we've got to put that in. Say so you're a P it 28. I'm out of five, which is, we've got a quick reference one up here. I'm going to back to five, five again. Um, and I want to go Kelty. Bridges, Kokodi, not above 2,000 feet VFR. So this screen's quite good because we've got a map. We've got all the VRPs and we can just tap them in really quick and it gives us a route. So then we close that down. Um, then we can answer and clear in on that route. So we'll be Golf India Tango, clear the transit the controls on Kelty, Bridges, Kokodi, and not above 2,000 feet. So we would go to, well, if you're on a basic service, we've got basic service to put in. We've got the Q&H to give your clear level, not above 2,000 feet. So you can see, Straight away, it's quite a convoluted process to generate a strip and it takes a bit of time. Um, now, if I press enter, that'll generate a strip and I don't want to do that, so I'll go back. But when I press enter, that will generate a strip just here. So, there's about 13 pop up boxes uh, to generate a strip from a free call from someone who's just called and hasn't rang ahead. You can see we're going to be quite busy shortly, so you've got to wait for a gap when you don't think any IFR is going to call you. So, that's why when you call, you'll get maybe standby. We're waiting for a gap to be able to answer you and type in all of those boxes. But if you rang ahead and you've already passed the details, you do one call sign and we hit the activate button. If you there, we hit it, it's got everything. It's got your call sign, it's got your route. And all we've got to do is clear on that route, have a quick look, clear on the route, um, give you a level of restriction, not above two VFR, and give you the Q&H and that's it. And the strip just appears and it's so much quicker for us. It's so much quicker for you guys. So you'll get a better service. You'll get through the zone quicker and it helps us out loads. Okay, so here's an example here. So same aircraft, Golf Bravo Indy Indy Tango, but the guy's rang ahead on the ground at Fife and he's booked out with us. So he calls up, first call, Golf Bravo Indy Indy Tango, and the first thing the controller's gonna do is gonna have a look for that. Oh, and there he is, right? Just hits it, there's the strip generated, everything in it, we haven't had to put anything in. The only thing I'm gonna wanna do is just open the map and just see down here the route in, and I can see straight away, he's asked to go Kelty, Bridges, Kokodi, and as quickly as that, couple of seconds I can answer them straight away. Gold Bravo India India Tango, clear to transit the control zone, Kelty Bridges, Kokodi, not above 2000 VVFR and all I've got to do is put the level in and it's straight there and again the only other thing I would do was give him a squawk which is the only thing that we don't put in in advance. But that is so much easier for a controller and it's so much easier for a GA guy trying to transit fairly busy controlled airspace by ringing ahead and all of that information's in. So really that's the way to go that's what we would encourage the GA guys to do out of Cumbernauld out of Perth and to be fair a lot of them do do it um, but just if you if you don't do that and you don't ring ahead and you wonder why you're asked to either hold outside controlled airspace or there's quite a bit of a delay in us calling you back it's usually because you haven't done that um, but yeah that, that's the way to go so just want to talk about um, mode S so Mode S is a feature we got in at Edinburgh um, a number of years ago and it's uh, it's pretty good. So if we just click on this Finair here, we have a Mode S, Mode S target information box up here which will give you a transponder code and it'll give um, the unique Mode S code for that aircraft. Now that never changes, so even if the call sign changes that number will never change. In Mode S we can see um, what the indicated airspeed is on the flight deck without asking the pilot, what his magnetic heading is. Um, so we can actually work out uh, a little bit of drift from that number compared to the heading assigned. Um, it's more or less altitude, so we can see. So if we clear an aircraft down to 4,000 feet, he reads back 4,000 feet, but actually dials into his autopilot 3,000 feet in error. Previously, we'd never be able to spot that. Now, if we click on it, we can check with more or less to see what he's got in the autopilot. 
So now we've actually got a fighting chance of spotting a level bust before it actually happens. Um, and you would never have been able to do that before. So this is quite a good thing to have. It's quite important for GA pilots in the area to know that we've got this. So what we can do is if you are in an aircraft and it's more or less equipped, um, your transponder will have one of these unique codes. In a GA aircraft, it does tend to be tied to the call sign. So even if you're not speaking to us and you're squawking 7000, we can click on that 7000 squawk and we can see what your aircraft reg is. Um, so if you're gonna, if you think it's a good idea just to scoot around the edge of controlled airspace and not call, which is a bit of a pain for us, um, you'll quite often see, certainly with me, I'll click on the 7000 squawk and call you blind and say, you know, Golf India Tango, are you on frequency? And hopefully you are. And um, the purpose of that is to try and get you on a squawk. So, right, why, why do we want you on a squawk? Well, we've got a number of systems on this radar, which um, one of them is an airspace infringement alarm. So on the airspace infringement alarm, if you get a 7000 squawk or a squawk that isn't an Edinburgh based squawk and he comes into controlled airspace with a more Charlie readout inside controlled airspace, we get an alarm. Now the alarm is quite bright, it's a little bit distracting, um, but the whole point of it is to stop an airspace infringer before it comes into conflict with other IFR traffic. So. To stop that from happening, the first thing we want to do to the GA guys, you call with a 7000 squawk, we want you on one of our squawks, and that means when you enter controlled airspace, the airspace infringement alarm doesn't go off. Um, so that's why even if you're scooting around the zone, even if you're just calling, you're going to go under the panhandle, you're not going to go inside controlled airspace. If you call us, I certainly would give you a squawk all of the time. That doesn't mean to say you're identified, that doesn't mean to say you're getting any kind of service other than a basic service, but if you did creep up into controlled airspace or anything like that, um, we can validate, verify your mode Charlie, make sure we know what height you're at, just so we can descend on top of you with IFR inbounds, like you see, we're quite busy. And um, that stops the airspace infringement alarm going off. So the first thing I do whenever the GA guys call is give you a squawk, and that's the reason why. So there'll be guys next door in an input room who'll be doing all the RT pretending to be pirates and this that and the other so if there's any mayday calls or anything like that they can just call that on the headsets just as if you were sitting in position. Oh, pass V1 and he's committed and he's got to go. Not really what you want to see. But... So at this point we'd want to see the guys. Tell the guy, left hand engine fire, when I hit the emergency button, when I start the air, uh, uh, start getting the fire vehicles <clears> outside, give him the options, tell radar, try and decide what he's going to do. So for me, if he's got a left hand engine fire and he's going to be shooting it down, I don't want to turn him into the dead engine because he has difficulty picking that wing up. So that's correct, I would turn him right, uh, put a bit of power on to pick that wing back up, want to do a right hand circuit. Um, you'd like to think their systems on board would be able to extinguish that fire before he gets back, but you never know. Pretty good there. Hopefully the kind of thing we'll never see in real life. I can definitely see how visually kind of, again, you know, as, as you said, right, if, if thinking about right turns versus left turns, yeah. if you had a left engine fire, I think being able to work on that visually and having the screens and kind of replicating sure. that. Uh, so again, it's really just things like, I mean, if it's a windy day, so if he lands, there's a good chance he's going to want to evacuate on the runway. So what he wants to know is he wants to know uh, which way the wind is. Because, uh, you, you know, you want the passengers disembarking the aircraft into wind so the wind's blowing the flames in the opposite direction kind of thing. Um, so we teach the guys, you know, that's the kind of information. Whether they realise they need it or not, that's what we're trying to get them to give. Pertinent information to get the guys off the aircraft <coughs> as quickly as possible. That's exactly what happened at Manchester with the British Air Force thing because the, uh, the controller told the aircraft to get this the right way around. He told the aircraft to turn left mm. when he stopped. Um, <clears throat> meaning that the wind would blow the flames away from the cabin, yeah. but the, the pilots decided to turn right because it was getting them closer to the fire station. Right. Um, but that then blew the flames over the cabin. So, you know, 
but it's um, some of this is experience. I mean, I'm not turning into the day, into the dead engine was something I picked up from an accident at uh, Glasgow on a fairly light aircraft where it was a it was a twin light twin position in a crew and he lost an engine and he <clears> turned into the dead engine. He couldn't pick the wing up and it went in. Um, and that must have been 15 years ago or something. Okay. It's a while ago. But ever since that incident, it's always been stuck into my head. If they've got an engine failure, if at all possible, do not turn them into the dead engine. So that's him now coming into yeah. short fire. Unfortunately, it's not the end of his bad day. All right. Ah, so he's going around. He's got me and Giddy fairly excellent. And again, gay failure or you know, gave indication failure was something that just happened quite a lot uh, 20 years ago, and I haven't had it for ages. Oh, they're awesome. jumping out now. <laughs> right, so you've got people <laughs> jumping out. <laughs> So this is basically turned into the invasion of Normandy. Yeah. Yeah. But the the point being, you can do pretty much anything with the system. You can plan for pretty much anything, you know. Um, but yeah, you used to get aircraft, you know, you bring them in for a low approach, go around, stand up on the balcony with the binoculars trying to see if the gaze down or not. I haven't had that for ages, but... No, I haven't. But again, all that kind of thing you can simulate, you know.